please welcome Everyone is Creative. Well, I'm very thankful to be here today to um, talk to you all about the theme today. You know, I had the opportunity a few months ago, actually, to be talking to a group of people at Spreadfest and about our mission that Ben was explaining to you in terms of serving people affected by HIV and AIDS in our community. And so during that presentation, we do these virtual kind of tours and um, bring people, you know, go out to the community and corporations and let people know what the impact is of HIV in our, in our community as well as what we're doing about that in terms of helping people build a future with HIV. And as part of that conversation, I was able to share part of my personal story about my survival and my journey with HIV. So afterwards, um, you know, this gentleman came up to me and it was Ben Toma. And he told me about Creative Mornings. And I really didn't know that much about it. I had kind of heard it in passing, but he gave me some details about that and said, um, he enjoyed hearing my story and wanted to talk to me more about that. So we, so we met for coffee and um, you know, he, he outlined for me kind of what the purpose of this group is and the manifesto, which I learned more about today. And with that, uh, we kind of went over some of the themes and what stood out for me was when we looked at the monthly themes and the one words was the theme of survival. And so I walked away from this and said, uh, well, that's really exciting. I got to really you know, think about you know, how, how would I talk about this? And so I texted my husband, Scott, and said, hey, I've, I've, I've talked about this group, um, Creative Mornings, and I'm, I'm going to be talking about survival in short text. And then me, the guy, texts back and he goes, are you doing a Bear Grylls talk? <laughs> um, and I'm thinking, um, no, you know my story here. It's like, no. And so I mentioned a couple other people. Every single person's response to the exact same thing. Are you doing a Bear Grylls talk? And so, no, I am not doing a Bear Grylls talk today. I'm not going to be telling you about how I made ratatouille in the wilderness with pine needles and grubs, <laughs> or how I did an emergency appendectomy while scuba diving on the Great Barrier Reef. Um, that is not my journey of survival. I really want to talk to you about survival kind of in all of its um, layers and context and shades of what I have personally experienced in terms of survival. And we all in this room are surviving every day, aren't we? You know, we talk about survival as like I survived, you know, that meeting with my boss this morning and thank goodness I'm out of that. Or how many of y'all said, you know, I survived the holidays with my in-laws. Uh, I need a t-shirt. Um, and you know, and apparently we've got a t-shirt, Austin will survive. So, you know, right there with you, right there with you, Ben. And so, you know, we're, we're all kind of going through that journey of survival. And for me, I think about survival and kind of all its different layers around, you know, whether it's passive survival or whether it's instinctual survival or whether it's survival with a purpose and creating an environment where we can survive and where we can thrive. And so as part of that conversation about survival, I wanna share with you my personal story and highlight you know, who I am and my journey as well as kind of what I do in my work. And it was 28 years ago, um, I was living in Chattanooga, Tennessee and I was a practicing uh, attorney, I was doing trial practice work and um, it was my birthday, March 15th, 1989, and I received my HIV diagnosis on my birthday. And just a little over a year beforehand, I was HIV negative. And so I, I thought, well, maybe, okay, I just tested positive, so you know, maybe this isn't such a big deal. And so six months later, however, I was diagnosed with AIDS because my health was declining so fast. And so here I am in Chattanooga, Tennessee, practicing law with a very conservative law firm. Um, I'm not telling anybody about my HIV status. And at the same time, I'm told I have less than a year to live because back then, if you lived for 12 months, that was a good thing. And damn it, I'm only 26 years old. As I kind of process that, you know, I come from this really, really strong Southern family. 
you know, um, I've got this really stereotypical architectural, you know, archetypal mom, you know, in terms of Faulknerian, you know, Dora Well Teak, you know, really Tennessee Williams. Um, and so, um, but we're not talking about that today because that's another whole show and that's therapy, actually. So I won't, I won't go into that. Um, but, you know, I was taught to fight. I was always taught to fight. You know, you know that, that's the way our family worked. You know, we, we fought for everything we got and we made sure, you know, we're competitive. Um, and that's kind of what I expected maybe to, to experience, but I, I didn't fight. And, and I wasn't even resigned, you know, and resigned to the fact of saying, well, maybe, you know, this is, you know, I've got a year, so I'm resigned to this. Let me live out my year and just deal with that. And, you know, that, that's it. It was more this kind of odd kind of passivity of survival. I just kept on doing what I was doing. I kept on working at the law firm. I kept on just being with my friends. I didn't really think about this. And, and maybe there was some element of resignation or denial maybe um, around what I was, was doing because I was kind of waiting to die. I was waiting to get sick. And after three months, I got really, really bored. <laughs> I mean, really bored, like, okay, I can't do this anymore. So then I go into this fight mode. And, you know, I, I, get a, I get my doctor, I get engaged, I learn, I get educated, and I start looking at, you know, what are the experimental studies, the experimental medications, and so I started getting, you know, I started ping-ponging into each experimental, you know, um, study that was going on um, to help me kind of live with HIV. And during this time, I still continue to get sick and I still continue to decline. And by this point, you know, I'm about two years into this now, I'm still working for the law firm, they don't know anything. I've lost like 40 pounds by this point. So I was 180, now I'm down to about um, 140. People are asking me, well, go, why are you losing all this weight? And I said, I'm training for a marathon. <laughs> I'm serious, that's exactly, I remember saying this to someone, and I'm thinking like, I can't even run down the hallway, you know. Um, so I'm training for this marathon, uh, not. Uh, <laughs> And so, um, and while I'm doing this also, I'm actually on chemotherapy. I'm on chemotherapy as I'm actually trying cases. I had this cool little, I was fascinated by medical care. I had these cool little vacuum tubes or, or uh, things that would, I would put into my suit jacket and thread it into a port that was in my chest. And so I'd be arguing a case in front of a, a jury and um, I was on chemotherapy. I mean, it's a horrible taste in my mouth. And so then during the break, I would go in there and flush up my veins with saline and heparin and then put all that stuff in my briefcase because I didn't have the files in there, I just had medical equipment. And uh, <laughs> then I'll go back and then close in front of the jury. And so, you know, that was kind of my survival in terms of, you know, you got to do what you got to do, right? You know, and th that's kind of where I was. And so even all during this time where I was doing this, I kept on getting sick and sick till finally to the point where I was so ill and, you know, I had to take disability. And um, again, no one in my law firm knew until the day I took disability. And um, I was kind of stripped of everything. I was stripped of my livelihood. I was stripped of my job. I was stripped of my health. And I was really stripped of a support system in terms of my professional career as well. And so with that, I was mentally, physically, and emotionally exhausted because I had been fighting and I had been doing it on my own. And so my survival in terms of that, you know, what I learned from my family was, you know, if, you, if you're gonna survive, you need to fight on your own, you need to be independent, because if you lose your independence, you lose the ability to control your life. You lose the ability to own your own survival. And now I was at this place where I couldn't rely upon myself anymore. I had to look to others. And so one of my best friends was executive director of an AIDS organization called Chattanooga Cares. And at Chattanooga Cares, um, I was hooked up and he, he got me into with a case manager who was a social worker who brought me the resources. And so he brought me up to, to, to resources and my case manager worked with me to get me home health care, to get me people to help fix meals in my home, to take me to the doctor. So, I was all of a sudden in this place now where I was working with this great organization, but these were kind of strangers to me, and now I'm relying upon people uh, to help me, and I've never asked for help before in my life. And so this kind of really strange thing in terms of, of what that means and asking for help. As I kind of you know, moved through this you know, process of learning of how to rely upon others, um, I also experienced this unexpected gift in terms of 
not asking for help, but receiving help. It was one evening where I was on a uh, friend, some friends of mine, Jane and Mike, came to my house, and they were both were attorneys, and they brought me dinner because I was uh, too sick at that point to cook dinner for myself, and they brought me dinner, and so um, afterwards we're sitting on the front porch, it's kind of a cool October evening in Chattanooga, and I'm sitting there and looking at my yard, and it's kind of a barren yard, whatever, and I was, I'm looking out, and I was kind of musing to myself. I, I don't think I was talking to them directly. I think I was just out externally processing and saying, God, wouldn't it be great for, to have a bulb garden, you know, daffodils, crocuses, hyacinths, you know, and, and tulips. Tulips are my favorite flower in the world. That's why, that's why you see the tulip here. And I'm, I saw that. I was like, wouldn't it be great to live until the springtime? and to see kind of a garden in full bloom, something I never had seen, you know, had in my life or seen before. And so I didn't think anything about it until the next morning I'm awakened and Jane and Mike are knocking on my door. And they said, get dressed. We have rented a tiller. We bought like 300 bulbs. <laughs> <laughs> and we're planting you a bulb garden. And they heard me. And so Mike gets out there with a tiller and digs up these two huge beds. Poor guy, he breaks the tiller, so he probably had to pay for it. Um, <laughs> and then Jane is planting the, the bulbs. And finally, you know, I felt a little bit well enough. And so I went down to the front steps and sat down next to her, kind of in, next to the um, garden. And we're wrapping the bulbs in steel wool. Trick here. Um, is, and that was to prevent the squirrels from eating the bulbs during the wintertime. And so we kind of finish this up, plant the bed, and, and, you know, and everything is done and mulched and ready you know, to, sur to survive the winter until the springtime. And for me, there was kind of a switch in terms of my survival, because now it's like this, you know, I've been fighting, 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 but now I've got something to look for, for too. I've, I, I, I've got something to shoot for. I'm gonna live, I'm gonna really, really think about the springtime, and I wanna see that garden bloom. So with that, um, you know, in October, uh, just a few months later in December, um, I got a call the day after Christmas from my doctor. And he told me, um, you gotta get to the hospital because your blood work's terrible. And so I had to get transportation. And so I go down to Atlanta, I get checked in the hospital. And by the time, even by the time I get to the hospital now, I am spiking a horrible fever. And by this time, I am now 100 pounds. And I'm on intravenous feeding. And so I'm now 80 pounds underweight. And so I get into the hospital and um, I just kind of wanted to, I, I, never, I, I never would let people take pictures of me when I was really, really sick. Um, but this is when I was probably about 125 pounds actually. And it's just a reminder of kind of what a lot of us went through in terms of surviving HIV. So, so I'm in the hospital and you got to remember this is you know, 1993 now and everybody is, is masked, gloved, and gowned. Um, and so I've got all these healthcare workers coming in and out of my hospital, and, and there's no contact, no human contact with me, uh, no touch, no connection. And think about Ebola, what we saw a couple of years ago in terms of what we see in terms of everybody being masked and gowned and gloved, that's what the experience was for me. And so at this point, I I'm, I'm now have like 107 degree fever. I am totally packed in ice day after day after day. They're trying to get, they don't know what's wrong with me. Until finally found out I had like a system-wide um, blood infection. And so during this time, you know, I don't have this contact until one morning. I kind of in this delirium, I kind of turned over my side of my head and in the doorway um, is a new nurse. And she has my chart. And she's looking at it, and so she's not masked, she's not gowned, she's not gloved. And so she looks at me from across the room, and she's this older black woman, she kind of looks tired, and maybe she had worked all night, um, maybe you know, it was just a you know, bad morning for her, I don't know. She looks at me, and she gives me this really warm, comforting smile. And she starts coming into the room, again, no mask, no gown, no glove. And she starts coming towards me, and she reaches out her hand towards me. And I'm thinking to myself, don't touch me. You're not supposed to touch me, because that was been my experience. And I couldn't say it because I was too sick to talk. And so she came towards me, and she put her hand on my shoulder, 
in my bare shoulder, and she goes, you know, I'm Mary, I'm gonna be taking care of you today. And then she looked at me with such compassion in her eyes, and she goes, honey, it's gonna be all right. It's gonna be all right. With that, those words that Mary gave me that it's gonna be all right, I knew that there was something for me to cling on to. Something kind of snapped in me in terms of like, of, of hope. And so I want to you know, think about Mary's journey too, because like, as I mentioned, you know, um, I don't know where she was that day. Can you imagine her survival of going in to a hospital room after hospital room after hospital room to see people in the AIDS ward that had no hope of living? What was her way of coping of survival? What was her story? What was she going through personally? How does she manage her day and her survival? And I wanna think that maybe those comforting words, despite what she knew maybe was the prognosis for most of us in terms of living, that those comforting words were her way of giving back and for her to give, for her to survive, to give comfort, but also to help others survive as well. What's interesting to me is that Mary will never know what her words meant to me because I never saw Mary again, interestingly enough. Even though I was in the hospital for two more months, I was in and out of that same ward for the next two or three years, I never saw Mary again. But what she said to me in terms of, honey, it's gonna be all right, it's gonna be all right, became this kind of spark in terms of my grasping onto survival. And I continued in and out of my delirium, you know, with my fever. Um, and as I would come out of it, I remember it's like, Mary said, it's gonna be all right, it's gonna be all right. And so during that time also thinking, I gotta remember that, that gift that Jane and Mike gave me in terms of my garden, it's like, okay, it's gonna be all right, and I'm gonna live to the springtime, that's my goal. I'm gonna live at least until the springtime and survive until the springtime so I can see the garden bloom and see those tulips in bloom. And for all of us, we never know really what one word, one comment, or what one interaction may mean in someone else's life. Because we intersect with each other all the time. You know, we intersected earlier in terms of introducing ourselves to each other. But we don't know what's, we don't know what's beneath the veneer as we talk to people in terms of where um, someone else may be in their survival journey, what they're what they're going through. And as we interact, we have the opportunity to be able to make a difference in terms of being present, being kind, and being compassionate. And I think the presence aspect of that is really important in terms of listening because we can have an impact every day in terms of someone else's survival because I personally have experienced that. And this is something I talk about and share the story with my staff at ASA when we do new employee orientation, because this is so important, the work that we do at Aid Services of Austin. Um, we are dealing with you know, people that have not been traumatized by HIV in terms of maybe living with it for you know, 20, 30 years, as well as people that are newly diagnosed that don't know what is ahead of them. And so our focus and energy is like being present. And it's about that human connection because we may be able to connect people to all the vast array of resources that we're able to provide. You have housing assistance, dental care, transportation, you know, emergency financial assistance, case management, you know, linkage into care, all these great things we provide, but that, that, that's all great. But what really matters is, am, are you connected to me and are you understanding who I am as a human being? Are you connecting at that level with me? And so I talk about that in terms of, you never know in terms of where we may be in our journey, in our day, in our survival, in terms of surviving that horrible meeting with the boss or whatever it may be. Um, I can't bring that into the space where I'm working with someone that may be vulnerable and may need to be connected. And we remind ourselves in terms of always being present and connected so that we can make a difference in terms of someone's journey from survival that's instinctual or someone that's passively survival or surviving, maybe thinking that they're gonna you know, eventually die to the point of where we're helping people at ASA to help them survive with a purpose, with a plan, and to move them from survival to thriving because that is a great option now that we actually have in terms of the treatment of HIV and AIDS. And for all of us, we're all surviving here. 
Um, you know, some of us are surviving passively, some of us are surviving instinctively. But we have the opportunity always to kind of shift that survival into creativity in terms of what is our purpose? And moving that purpose from necessarily that survival is being um, attributed to trauma, which is a lot of times we talk about, it. it's like survivor, survival is trauma, but survival being a positive thing and positively living our survival. And for me, that was my transition, you know, in terms of when I was in that hospital room, you know, I was still there, you know, for about two more months. And as I came out of the hospital, um, I got discharged to go into home health care. And um, it, I got discharged at the height of spring. So I was driving home. I didn't really know what to expect. And so um, I pulled up to my house, you know, in terms of, you know, someone transported me from the hospital. And my yard sit, um, sits up off the road, and so I had to climb some stairs to get to my yard. And so it was this beautiful blue day. And so I was walking up the steps. This is what I saw. I saw my garden in full bloom, and I lived until the spring. And it, it, I and the garden had survived the winter, and the bulbs had survived the squirrels, apparently, too. <laughs> <laughs> and you know, this was such a moment for me in terms of this is allowed me to kind of get to this place where I could move beyond just maybe the more immediate steps of purpose. And you know, maybe I can think, think longer term in terms of my survival. And there's me um, with some of my flowers, the daffodils and the tulips there. As I, you know, recovered and um, over the next couple of years, three years in particular, I was able, you know, I was in and out of the hospital and sick, but then uh, finally I survived long enough in 1996 where these great class of medications came out and me along with thousands and thousands of other people finally had the opportunity to um, get on these new medications that allowed us to start living with HIV and start realizing that maybe possibly at that point there was a future in terms of of, of living with HIV as opposed to dying due to the complications of AIDS. And what I've learned from these experiences um, is that these different types of survivals and strategies for me, um, no matter how independent I was, no matter you know, how strong I thought I should be, my survival really was, upon, was really um, dependent upon the contributions of others. And even some of this, you know, random kind of kindness of others, you know, my case manager that helped me initially and the first time I asked for help, Mary the nurse in terms of saying, honey, it's gonna be all right. And then my friends, Mike and Jane, who gave me this wonderful gift in terms of giving me a purpose and creating an opportunity for me to survive until that springtime. And today though, even though I have these vivid memories of what it means in terms of people sharing their experiences with me and moving to that space of survival of where I'm creating that opportunity and I'm creating that positive, positive living scenario, I still fall back and we all fall back into that feeling of survival of like, I cannot just get to this day. You know, can I just get to this moment? You know, am I just kind of plodding along? And I have to remind myself you know, to reorient my thoughts and my purpose in order to change that survival into more of a positive approach in order for me to live meaning, meaningfully. And the same thing that we do at our work at Aid Services of Austin is shifting that focus of how people can empower themselves and live, positively live with HIV and live for a future. And so I'm very privileged you know, to be able to work with my staff at Aid Services of Austin to be able to kind of move them into that space because we now have this great opportunity of, of where we are in terms of people living with HIV. Um, people are able now, we moved from 30 years ago where we were holding people's hands as they died to the place where you know, we were holding people up and supporting them. And now we're able to let people go and build a future for themselves, live a life, have a family, have a job, go back and get their education and be part of our community and positively live with HIV. And for each of us is how are we each positively living our own survival every day 
with a purpose and not falling back into that passivity or that instinctual survival in terms of just living and just surviving. And I'm very privileged to be able to work with our clients. You know, it's very great to be able to see that, you know, go into the agency and see these wonderful people and the courage that they have and watch the transformations in terms of giving, not only our giving them hope, but also how they know that they have the tools and they have a future ahead of them. And so that's a great privilege for me as well in terms of the work and having seen this over the arc of 30 years now, both being a client and now working in this field, it's been a great experience for me in terms of you know, knowing now that we have the tools for people to have this ability to survive and now, and now actually to thrive. So a few things I just wanna kind of leave with you. Um, in this world we are taught um, and we're told that to be a hero, you have to do something extraordinary. You have to be, do something extremely special to be a hero. And, you know, maybe that's rescuing someone from a fire or you know, a cure you know, for a disease or something just really, really um, extravagant. And for me personally, I think you know, through my experience is you know, being a hero is about being kind, being compassionate, being present because those acts of kindness that I've received in terms of affecting my survival and helping me survive, those Jane, Mike, Mary, and my case manager, Lori, all are heroes to me in my life. Sometimes for each of us, sometimes it just takes a spark, a little bitty spark of kindness that will be able to make a difference in someone's life and affect how they change their life. And it may be just something for the day. Think about this, you know, in our interactions with people, it may be something so simple and you never will know. Mary will never know what she did for me. You may never know what you do for someone else in terms of your presence and creating a, a space for someone to maybe move into a space where they can survive that day or that hour or that meeting with the boss. Uh, or in my case, meeting with a board, um, and you know, creating that opportunity for them to uh, have a difference, but also how that impacts us as we give that kindness, as we give that compassion, what does that do for our own survival and our own meaning? So maybe this kind of kindness and compassion that we give in small dosages to each other gives us an environment where we can be creative, where we can reach our potential and we can survive and not only survive, we can thrive. And for each of us, it's, as I mentioned, it's simple and maybe it seems a little even trite, but sometimes that's maybe what you know, the purpose of life is. It's the simple things that are the most meaningful. So as we kind of conclude today, I just wanna say, honey, it's gonna be all right. Thank you.